Part 12, Jezebels. Chapter 31, page 199. Every night when I go to bed, I think, in the morning, I will wake up in my own house and things will be back the way they were. It hasn't happened this morning either. I put in my clothes, summer clothes. It's still summer. It seems to have stopped at summer. July, it's breathless days and sauna nights, hard to sleep. I make a point of keeping track. I should scratch marks on the wall, one for each day of the week, and run a line through them when I have seven. But that, but what would be the use? This isn't a jail sentence. There's no time here that can be done and finished with. Anyway, all I have to do is ask to find out what day it is. Yesterday was July the 4th, which used to be Independence Day before they abolished it. September 1st will be Labor Day. They still have that, though it didn't used to have anything to do with mothers. But I can tell time by the moon, lunar, not solar. I bend over to do up my red shoes, lighter weight these days with discreet slits in them, though nothing so daring as sandals. It's an effort to stoop, despite the exercises. I can feel my body gradually seizing up, refusing. Being a woman this way is how I used to imagine it would be to be very old. I feel I even walk like that, crouched over, my spine constricting to a question mark, my bones leached of calcium and porous as limestone. When I was younger, imagining age, I would think, maybe you appreciate things more when you don't have much time left. I forgot to include the loss of energy. Some days I do appreciate things more, eggs, flowers. But then I decide I'm only having an attack of sentimentality, my brain going pastel technicolor, like the beautiful sunset greeting cards they used to make so many of in California. High gloss hearts. The danger is gray out. I'd like to have Luke here in this bedroom while I'm getting dressed so I could have a fight with him. Absurd, but that's what I want. An argument about who should put the dishes in the dishwasher whose turn it is to sort the laundry, clean the toilet, something daily and unimportant in the big scheme of things. We could even have a fight about that, about unimportant, important. What a luxury it would be. Not that we did it much. These days I script whole fights in my head and the reconciliations afterwards too. I sit in my chair, the wreath on the ceiling floating above my head, like a frozen halo, a zero, a hole in space where a star exploded, a ring on water where a stone's been thrown, all things white and circular, I wait for the day to unroll, for the earth to turn according to the round face of the implacable clock. The geometrical days which go around and around smoothly oiled, sweat already on my upper lip. lip. I wait for the arrival of the inevitable egg, which will be lukewarm like the room and will have a green film on the yolk and will taste faintly of sulfur. Today, later with Off Glen on our shopping walk, we go to the church as usual and look at the graves. Then to the wall, only two hanging on it today, one Catholic, not a priest though, placarded with an upside down cross and some other sect I don't recognize. The body is marked only with a J in red. It doesn't mean Jewish. Those would be yellow stars. Anyway, there haven't been many of them because they declared sons of Jacob. They were declared sons of Jacob and they were therefore special. They were given a choice. They could convert or emigrate to Israel. A lot of them emigrated. If you believe the news, I saw a boatload of them on the TV leaning over the railings in their black coats and hats and their long beards, trying to look as Jewish as possible in costumes fished up from the past. The women with shawls over their heads, smiling and waving, a little stiffly, it's true, as if they were posing, and another shot of the richer ones lined up for the planes. Of Glenn says some other people got out that way by pretending to be Jewish, but it wasn't easy because of the test they gave you, and they've tightened up on that now. You don't get hanged only for being a Jew, though. You get hanged for being a noisy Jew who won't make the choice, or for pretending to convert. That's been on the TV, too. Raids at night, secret hordes of Jewish things dragged out from under beds, Torahs, uh, Talithes, Magan Davids, and the owners of them, sullen-faced, unrepentant, pushed by the eyes against the walls of their bedrooms, while the sorrowful voice of the announcer tells us, voiceover, about their perfidity, perfidy, and ungratefulness. So the J was isn't for Jew. What could it be? Jehovah's Witness? Jesuit? Whatever it meant, he's just as dead. After this ritual viewing, we continue on our way, heading as usual for some open space we can cross, so we can talk, if you can call it talking, these clipped whispers projected through the funnels of our white wings. It's more like a telegram, a verbal semaphore, amputated speech. We can never stand long in any one place. We don't want to be picked up for loitering. Today we turn in the opposite direction from soul scrolls to where there's an open park of sorts with a large old building on it, ornate late Victorian with stained glass. 
It used to be called Memorial Hall, although I never knew what it was a memorial for, dead people of some kind. Mora told me once that it used to be where the undergraduates ate in the earlier days of the university. If a woman went in there, they'd throw buns at her, she said. Why, I, I said, Mora became over the years increasingly versed in, in such anecdotes. I didn't much like it, this grudge holding against the past. To make her go out, said Mora. Maybe it was more like throwing peanuts at elephants, I said. Mora laughed. She could always do that. Exotic monsters, she said. We stand looking at the, this building, which is in shape more or less like a church, a cathedral. Of Glen says, I hear that's where the eyes hold their banquets. Who told you, I say. There's no one near. We can speak more freely, but out of habit, we keep our voices low. The grapevine, she says. She pauses, looks sideways at me. I can sense the blur of white in her wings as her wings move. There's a password, she says. A password, I asked? What for? So you can tell, she says, who is and who isn't. Although I can't see what use it is for me to know, I ask, what is it then? Mayday, she says. I tried it on you once. Mayday, I repeat. I remember that day. Mayday. Don't use it unless you have to, says Elf Glenn. It isn't good for us to know too, about too many of the others in the network in case you get caught. I find it hard to believe in these whisperings, these revelations, although I always do at the time. Afterwards, though, they seem improbable, childish even, like something you do just for fun, like a girls' club, like secrets at school, or like the spy novels I used to read on weekends when I should have been finishing my homework, or like late-night television. Passwords, things that could not be told, people with secret identities, dark linkages. This does not seem as if it ought to be the true shape of the world, but that in my own illusion. But that is my own illusion, and hangover from a version of reality I learned in the former time. And networks. Networking, one of my mother's old phrases, musty slang of yesteryear. Even in her 60s, she still did something she called that, though as far as I could see, all it meant was having lunch with some other woman. I leave of Glen at the corner. I'll see you later, she says. She glides along, away along the sidewalk, and I go up the walk towards the house. There's Nick, had a skew. Today he doesn't even look at me. He must have been waiting around for me, though, to deliver his silent message. Because as soon as he knows I've seen him, he gives the whirlwind one last swipe with a chamois and walks briskly off towards the garage door. I walk along the gravel between the slabs of overgreen, overgreen lawn. Serena Joy is sitting under the willow tree in her chair, cane propped on at her elbow. Her dress is crisp, cool cotton. For her, it's blue, watercolor, not this red of mine that sucks in heat and blazes with it at the same time. Her profile's towards me. She's knitting. How can she bear to touch the wool in this heat? But possibly her skin's gone numb. Possibly she feels nothing, like one formerly scalded. I lower my eyes to the path, glide by her, hoping to be invisible, knowing I'll be ignored. But not this time. Avred, she said. I pause, uncertain. Yes, you. I turn towards her at my blinkered sight. Come over here. I want you. I walk over the grass and stand beside her, looking down. You can sit, she says. Here, take the cushion. I need you to hold this wool. She's got a cigarette, the ashtrays on the lawn beside her, and a cup of something, tea or coffee. It's too damn close in there. You need a little air, she says. I sit, putting down my basket, strawberries again, chicken again, and I note the swear word, something new. She fits the skein of wool over my two outstretched, outstretched hands, starts winding. I'm leashed, it looks like, manacle, manacled, cobwebbed, that's closer. The wool is gray and has absorbed moisture from the air. It's like a wetted baby blanket and smells faintly of damp sheep. At least my hands will get lanolined. Serena whines, the cigarette held in the corner of her mouth, smoldering, sending out tempting smoke. She whines slowly and with difficulty because of her gradually cripping, crippling hands, but with determination. Perhaps the knitting for her involves a kind of willpower. Maybe it even hurts. Maybe it's been medically prescribed. Ten rows of a, a day of plain, ten of pearl. Though she must do more than that, I see those evergreen trees and geometric boys and girls in different light evidence of her stubbornness and not altogether despicable. My mother did not knit or anything like that, but whenever the, whenever she would bring things back from the cleaners, her good blouses, winter coats, she'd save up the safety pins and make them into a chain. Then she'd pin the chain somewhere, her bed, the pillow, a chair back, even the oven mitt in the kitchen so she wouldn't lose them. Then she'd forget about them. I would come upon them here and there in the house, the houses, Tracks of her presence, remin remnants of some lost intention. 
like signs on a road that turns out to lead nowhere. Throwbacks to domesticity. Sorry. Um, well then, Serena says, she stops winding, le leaving me with my hands still garlanded with animal hair and leaves a, takes a cigarette end from her mouth to butt it out. Nothing yet? I know what she's talking about. There are not that many subjects that could be spoken about between us. There's not, that, there's not much common ground except this one mysterious and chancy thing. No, I say nothing. Too bad, she says. It's hard to imagine her with a baby, but the Marthas would take care of it mostly. She'd like me pregnant, though, over and done with and out of the way. No more humiliating, sweaty tangles. No more flesh triangles under her um, starry canopy of silver flowers. Peace and quiet. I can't imagine she'd want such good luck for me or any other reason. Your time's running out, she says. Not a question, a matter of fact. Yes, I say neutrally. She's lighting a cigarette, fumbling with the lighter. Definitely her hands are getting worse. But it would be a mistake to offer to do it for her. She'd be offended. A mistake to notice weakness in her. Maybe he can't, she says. I don't know who she means. Does she mean the commander or God? If it's God, she should say won't. Either way, it's heresy. It's only women who can't, who remain stubbornly closed, damaged, defective. No, I say, maybe he can't. I look up at her. She looks down. It's the first time we've looked into each other's eyes in a long time, since we met. The moment stretches out between us, bleak and level. She's trying to see whether or not I'm up to reality. Maybe, she says, holding the cigarette, which she has failed to light. Maybe you should try it another way. Does she mean on all fours? What other way, I say? I must keep serious. Another man, she says. You know I can't, I say, careful not to let my irritation show. It's against the law. You know the penalty. Yes, she says. She's ready for this. She's thought it through. I know you can't officially, but it's done. Women do it frequently, all the time. With doctors, you mean? I say, remembering the sympathetic brown eyes, the gloveless hand. The last time I went, it was a different doctor. Maybe someone caught him out, or a woman reported him. Not that they'd take her word without evidence. Some do that, she says, her tone almost affable now. Uh, though distance, it's as if we're considering a choice of nail polish. That's how Avoran did it. The wife knew, of course. She pauses to let this sink in. I would help you. I would make sure nothing went wrong. I think about this. Not with the doctor, I say. No, she agrees. And for this moment, at least we are cronies. This could be a kitchen table. It could be a date we're discussing. Some girlish, girlish stratagem of ploys and flirtation. Sometimes they blackmail, but it doesn't have to be a doctor. It could be someone we trust. Who, I say. I was thinking of Nick, she says, and her voice is almost soft. He's been with us a long time. He's loyal. I could fix it with him. So that's who does her little black market errands for her. Is this what she, he always gets in return? What about the commander, I say. Well, she says with firmness, no, more than that. A clenched look like a purse snapping shut. We just won't tell him, will we? The idea hangs between us, almost visible, almost palpable. Heavy, formless, dark, collusion of a sort, betrayal of a sort. She does want that baby. It's a risk, I say. More than that, it's my life on the line, but that's where it will be sooner or later, one way or another, whether I do or don't. We both know this. You might as well, she says, which is what I think, too. All right, I say, yes. She leans forward. Maybe I could get something for you, she says, because I've been good. Something you want, she adds, wheedling almost. What's that, I say? I can't think of anything I truly want that she'd be likely or able to give me. A picture, she says, as, as, as if offering me some juvenile treat. An ice cream, a trip to the zoo. I look up at her again, puzzled. Of her, she says, your little girl. But only maybe. She knows where they've put her then, where they're keeping her. She's known all along. Something chokes in my throat. The bitch not to tell me, bring me news, any news at all. Not even to let on. She's made of wood or iron, I can't imagine. But I can't say this. I can't lose sight, even of so small a thing. I can't let go of this hope. I can't speak. She's actually smiling, coquettishly even. There's a hint of her former small-screen mannequin's allure, flickering over her face like momentary static. It's too damn hot for this, don't you think, she says. She lifts the wool from my two hands where I've been holding it all this time. Then she takes the cigarette she's been fiddling with and a little awkwardly presses it into my hand, closing my fingers around it. Find yourself a match, she says. They're in the kitchen. You can ask Rita for one. You can tell her I said so. Only the one, though, she adds roguishly. We don't want to ruin your health.